Good evening. My name is Tony Penny, and on behalf of Mrs. Reagan and our Board of Directors, welcome to this evening's Reagan Forum. In honor of our men and women in uniform who defend our freedom around the world, uh, I invite you to please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. So here at the Reagan Library, we currently have an extraordinary but temporary exhibit on display, uh, and some of you may have seen it. It's called A. Lincoln, Rail Splitter to Rushmore. And it's one of the most comprehensive exhibits ever mounted on the life of Abraham Lincoln. We have artifacts from more than 30 major collectors of Lincoln memorabilia, as well as several sets and costumes from the DreamWorks Studios award-winning film, Lincoln. And while this is exhibit is in the house, we thought it wholly appropriate to invite our guest, Rich Lowry, to speak on his newest book, which is entitled Lincoln Unbound, how an ambitious young rail splitter saved the American dream and how we can do it again. So according to estimates, there have been thousands upon thousands of books and journal articles written about Abraham Lincoln. And despite the fact that he was assassinated nearly a century and a half ago in Ford's theater, one could argue that he plays even a more powerful role in our national imagination today than he did in April of 1865. We're constantly reminded of Lincoln. Every time we spend five dollars, we're reminded of Lincoln. <laughs> or if we get four cents in change, we're reminded of Lincoln four times. <laughs> Every President's Day when our children come home with paper hats and beards, we're reminded of Lincoln. And every time we visit one of the 33 cities or counties or attend one of the estimated 667 schools named for him, we are reminded of Lincoln. Not only do we have Lincoln as kind of the pulp pop culture figure and the great American icon, but we continue to be indebted to Lincoln as America's moral compass, the great emancipator, and the man who preserved the Union. So how does Rich Lowry's new book add to the already extensive portrait of and homage to our 16th president? Well, it seems he has a new angle on an old story and that's what he's gonna tell us about this evening. What I can divulge is that while the book is a powerful mixture of both history and politics, it doesn't focus on the Civil War or the drama surrounding his assassination. As Mr. Lowry says early in the book, Lincoln's vision for the country goes deeper than either of those highly compelling and consequential things. So much else about Lincoln is the how or the what. This book, is the why. In telling why, Rich Lowry makes an explicit connection between Lincoln's childhood and upbringing and the policies and politics that would render him one for the ages years later. He explains how his parents, his personal life, and his reverence for both hard work and the opportunities afforded to those who are willing to do hard work defined him, and how we can apply those same lessons to both today's political environment and the future of our country. It's also my hope that our guest this evening will speak a little bit on maybe some connections and similarities he sees between our 16th president and our 40th. In some ways, they have similar stories. These two gentlemen were born of common roots in neighboring states of Kentucky and Illinois, but neither man can truly be deemed common. Both Lincoln and President Reagan were voracious readers natural storytellers, and eloquent communicators. They were both pragmatic and passionate in their individual beliefs. They came from humble beginnings and despite their successes, carried themselves with great humility their entire lives. They not only took advantage of the opportunities that their generations provided, but they sought out those and other opportunities to advance the country as a whole. They each had their own view of how government should work and what its responsibilities are. But as Rich Lowry writes in his book, at a time of our country's underdevelopment, Lincoln sought to remove the physical impediments to joining together the national economy. At a time of onerous government, Ronald Reagan sought to remove obstacles created by burdensome policies and economic mismanagement 
on inflation, taxes, and regulation. The genius of Lincoln's political leadership was how uncompromising he was in his ultimate goal and how compromising he was in the course of getting there. He combined strategic fixity with tactical flexibility, and exactly the same can be said of Ronald Reagan. Many of you may know Rich Lowry from his Fox News commentary or his syndicated columns. He has worked as a writer for many years, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Time Magazine, Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the Los Angeles Times, among others. He's written on everything from Irving Berlin's White Christmas to gun control, the recent IRS scandal, immigration challenge, uh, and even Mayor Bloomberg's soda folly. <laughs> Rich Lowry also writes an opinion column for the must-read Washington website and newspaper Politico. In 1992, he joined the team at National Review, America's most widely read and influential magazine for conservatives, founded by Ronald Reagan's good friend, William Buckley. And only five years later, he was named the editor. His 2004 book, Legacy, Paying the Price for the Clinton Years, was a New York Times bestseller. And Lincoln Unbound, which just came out Tuesday, uh, last week, is already number two on the Amazon political biography bestseller list. So we are in for a real treat tonight. Uh, and please join me in welcoming Rich Lowry. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for that warm welcome. It's such an honor to be here in this, this place, devoted to the memory of such a, a wonderful American. So I'd really like to thank everyone from the, the Reagan Library for having me, and thank all of you uh, for being here, and especially thank Mr. Lincoln for showing up in the back row there. Thanks, thanks for coming, Abe. I appreciate it. I knew, I knew he'd be there for me. Um, no, actually, I knew I was here in, in Reagan country when I went down um, to my hotel this morning to have breakfast, and they, they were showing Fox News on the TV, which in no hotel in America is that true. And I'm a very conservative guy who lives and works in, in very uh, liberal New York, so I'm used to being embattled. In fact, I used to live in an area called Union, Union Square. It's right near uh, NYU, um, and just thronged with college kids. And in 2000. 7, 2008, this was the very epicenter, I believe, in the country of Obama mania. And I still remember on election night, I came back from Fox News 2 or 3 in the morning. I was tired. I was depressed. I was despairing. You know, feeling all the emotions you would expect uh, on, uh, upon the advent of an era of hope and change. And um, <laughs> it was, in my neighborhood, literally, it was like we'd won a war. It was just thronged with these kids. They're banging on pots. They're singing songs. They're chanting. They're spontaneously high-fiving uh, people on the streets, including me. Little did they know. And whenever I, I think back to this um, night, it reminds me of a great Reagan story. When he was governor of California, he apparently went to a meeting of the Board of Trustees at the University of California. And this was a, a crazy time when there were a lot of protests, a lot of uh, demonstrations. And one broke out while he was there. Um, and his aides wanted to sneak him out of the back of the building to avoid all these students. He's like, no, nope, I'm going to walk right through them. Walks right through them, gets in his car. And then these, um, you know, stereotypical hippie types, bearded, probably unbathed, maybe a little smelly, uh, you know, they start banging on the, the car, chanting, we are the future. We are the future. And apparently Reagan uh, just cracked the window a little bit and said, in that case, I'm going to sell my bonds. <laughs> So um, I've written this book on Lincoln, and it's just been out about a week, but I've already had some interesting experiences. My wife and I, we live in Manhattan, and um, we live in a doorman building, and one of our doormen is an immigrant from Ireland, really hardworking guy. He just had a, a kid from, as far as we can tell, he has basically conservative sentiments from various asides he shares with us. So I proudly presented them this book the other day, and he was delighted to get it and very happy. And then he looks at it more closely, and he says, wait a minute, you wrote a book on Lincoln? I thought you were a Republican. <laughs> and he, and he was saying this, this wasn't a job, you know, it was a really sincere inquiry, which I, I think shows we have some work to do on this front. And then the other interesting thing that's happened to me when I was flying out here, and um, I was on my wireless, 
and my wife emails me and she says, did you buy $500 worth at Walmart? And I'm very book obsessed at the moment, so I thought she was asking me if I bought with our credit card $500 worth of my own book. And I was thinking, look, I'm a desperate author, but I'm not quite that desperate. Um, and it turns out it was a fraudulent charge, but if it had been someone, and he wasn't buying my book, but if he had, it might have been the perfect crime, you know, to steal an author's credit card and buy his books with them. But um, my wife caught this, I never would, but she just watches our credit card account like a hawk, I mean, in real time. A couple weeks ago, um, she said, you know, I hadn't heard from you in a while, but it wasn't a big deal because I knew you were at the bar watching the hockey game. Because she's like watching my credit card, probably each beer as it was, it was coming up. So I know a lot of you are worried about what the NSA surveillance program might be doing. I'm not. I, I already live. This is, this is my life as a, a new husband over the last two years. And just one last thing to just give you an idea how this works. Before I left uh, the other day, um, she gave me this card that spells out what shirt and tie I'll wear every day while I'm away from home. So this, this is Wednesday, you probably can't see it, but pink shirt and pink tie, and here you go. See? Am I a great husband or what, ladies? Please. All right, so Abraham Lincoln, I think it's really important to get him right, and for a couple reasons. First of all, the progressives have been after him for about a century. It started with TR, FDR was a big uh, Lincoln body snatcher, and then perhaps we have the worst of all in uh, the White House right now. You know, he announced his candidacy in Springfield in front of the old state house there, took the oath on the Lincoln Bible. So um, if we're going to properly resist this, we need to understand Reagan, sorry, Lincoln. And we also need to get uh, Lincoln right, because I think fundamentally, if you get Lincoln right, you get America right, and then you get what should be our animating purpose as conservatives right. And Lincoln um, was always underestimated in his day, and I think even now, this, despite uh, um, how, how many people consider him a hero, is still kind of underestimated. There's this image of him as a common man, you know, this tribune of the common people and common sense and this accidental president. And that's just not right. Um, and we're underestimating him now if we believe that. And he was underestimated then partly because of his looks. You know, very ungainly man, didn't look uh, like much. He said once in the White House that he had a, a great flash of insight had occurred to him that God must love common looking people more than anyone else because he made more of them. Um, and, um, but th but this, is, this is not true. I mean, he was ferociously ambitious, just starting in his youth. He had an exceptional mind. People recall him borrowing newspapers from them when he was a kid. He was interested in politics even then. And he would return them and be able to recite the editorials pretty much line by line. And he had a tremendous, almost unfailing judgment about people and about how the world works. Once he was trying to illustrate to people that you actually can't influence people's behavior by um, promises of far off rewards or threats of far off punishments. So he told a story about the, the Irishman who stole a spade and someone said to him in the politically incorrect argo of the day, Patty, you know, you may have stolen that uh, spade and gotten away with it, but when you die and when you go and meet your maker, you're going to have to pay for that spade. The Irishman says, well, if you're going to credit me for that long, I think I'll take another. Um, and, and Lincoln had this, this great um, appreciation of human nature and how the world worked because he was dinged up uh, by life. Um, there's this heart-rending note he wrote when he was in the White House. He, you know, he loved theater, he loved plays, and he wrote a private letter to an actor commenting on the Shakespeare play he was in, talking about which plays were his favorite ones, which Hamlet monologues are better than others, and the actor was delighted at the publicity potential of this, published it in the newspaper. All this mockery has rained down on Lincoln's head. You know, this guy is barely president, can barely be president now. Look, he's a national theater critic. How idiotic. And the actor felt badly about it and wrote a letter apologizing. And Lincoln said, no, you know, don't worry about it much because I've encountered a lot of ridicule in my life without much malice and a lot of kindness that's not quite free of ridicule. I'm used to it. And he also, in the 1850s, there's a note that always gets me that he wrote to himself. 
That's Stephen Douglas. They came up together. They're in the Illinois house together, both very young and very talented and very ambitious men. And he said, you know, I've known him 23 years. And this is when Douglas is a senator, famous senator. This is, uh, Douglas is a potential presidential candidate. And Lincoln is out of politics after one year in the House of Representatives with no political prospects whatsoever. And he says, here's Stephen Douglas, a great success in the race of life. And here I am, a flat failure. Um, and if you want to, want to understand Lincoln and the hard knocks he experienced, you really have to begin by going all the way back to the beginning. Born in Kentucky, the middle of nowhere, then his family moves to Indiana, literally in the middle of nowhere. People in that area would report in their log cabins when they had fires going at night, they could see through the chinks in the logs the eyes of bears shining right outside. There was apparently a little girl in that area who was killed by a panther because her brother could not kill the panther with a hatchet to the skull fast enough. So this was not suburban bliss uh, by any means. It was an unforgiving environment. When Lincoln was a child, his um, mother and his, his uncle and his aunt, all right at the same time, died of something called milk sick. A cow would wander off into the forest, would eat a poison root, um, or poisonous weed, come back with, and the milk would be poisoned. No one would know, there's no way to know. Drink the milk and literally you'd be dead in a week in the most horrifying manner possible. So his mom dies that way, he has to fashion the wooden coffin with his dad. She's buried without the benefit of any sort of sermon because there's no minister in the area and one didn't come by until months later. His daughter, as, as was, uh, sorry, his sister, as was very common, died in childbirth. And the Lincolns were very upset about this. They thought the in-laws didn't do enough to help her and to save her. And the in-laws in explanation, which again gives you an idea of what life was like, uh, was that the nearest doctor was too drunk to come and help her. And Lincoln said of this time, this place, there was absolutely nothing to excite ambition for education. <clears throat> His mom signed her name with an X. His stepmom, a wonderful lady who encouraged him, was a blessing, a great blessing to him, signed her name with an X. His father could barely sign his name, or as Lincoln said, could bunglingly uh, sign his name. Now, there were schoolhouses, but one of the main um, instructional techniques was beating children. Uh, Lincoln in the White House told a story that kind of captured uh, the atmosphere. He said there was this uh, schoolhouse where they were, um, all the kids were there, and they were reading from the book of Daniel, from the Bible. Now, you've got to cast your mind back to this way distant time when it was actually legal to read a uh, Bible in a classroom. Um, but they're uh, reading the story of Nebuchadnezzar, and this one poor kid couldn't, kept on um, uh, stumbling over the name Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. I probably messed, just messed it up myself. So he messed these names up, boom, slapped upside the head uh, by this instructor. And then the other kids keep reading, and it's going around the room, and the kid is counting up you know, how many people are, uh, kids are left until it's coming back around to him. He's looking desperately down to the lines uh, that are coming up, and then he starts whimpering. And the, the instructor's like, now what? Now why are you crying? And he said, mister, here come those three damn fellows again. <laughs> and he probably got whacked again. So th this was, Lincoln's ambition was to escape this, to leave it behind, to end this kind of isolation so no one had to live like that ever again. And that undergirded his entire worldview, uh, his entire life. And if you want, I think, the essence of Lincoln um, in this respect, um, it's a, a st another story he told in the White House. We associate him with an ax, right? We call him the rail splitter. It's part of the name of the exhibit here. It's in the subtitle of my book. He hated splitting rails. He never wanted to split a damn rail again in his life. And in the White House, he told about how um, when he was younger, he had a rowboat by the side of the Ohio River. Two guys drive up in a carriage with their luggage. There's a steamboat coming down the river, but there's no wharf, so they need Lincoln's help to get out uh, to the steamboat. And they ask him, will you take us out? He does, takes their luggage, gets them on the steamboat. Um, they're about to steam off, and he says, wait a minute, you didn't pay me anything. And to his shock and surprise, each of them threw a silver half dollar down into the bottom of his boat. And Lincoln said in the White House, I realized at that moment that I had earned my first dollar, and I was a more hopeful and optimistic being from that time. And that's the kind of economy that Lincoln wanted to create, where people got paid. And um, this is why he was not a Democrat, okay? <laughs> now, I'm, I'm mixed on uh, Democrats. I have a very nuanced view 
I'm with Warren Delano, F FDR's um, grandfather, some relation, who said, it's, it's not that all Democrats are horse thieves, it's just that all, all horse thieves are Democrats. Um, <laughs> But everyone Lincoln grew, grew up around was a Democrat. His family, Democrats, his neighbors, Democrats. They all worshipped uh, Andrew Jackson, who was this great back, backwoodsman, obviously a great general, also a mean son of a bitch. If you want to get a little idea of what Andrew Jackson was like, think of, um, God rest his soul, but the, the late Senator Arlen Specter, and think of someone with that kind of personality, but who might kill you, okay? <laughs> that, that was Andrew Jackson. And the, the Jacksonian Democrats and the Jeffersonian Democrats before them, they celebrated this backwoods existence. They romanticized agrarianism and agricultural life. They thought it was uniquely virtuous, and they were perfectly happy for the country to remain in that state. Lincoln went in a completely opposite direction. He became a Whig, and he became a Republican. And the economic vision was all about how you create something more diverse and vibrant than that. So if you're not just going to have a barter economy anymore, you need cash. If you need cash, you need banks. If you're not going to be uh, exclusively an agricultural country anymore, you need industry, well, you're going to foster industry through a tariff. And if you want to have a, a market, you actually have to have the country knit together. You need canals. You need railroads. And Lincoln loved those things. Now, this is where uh, his more activist view of government comes in. He wanted to support those sort of transportation improvements, as they are called, um, with, with government subsidies and land grants and the like. I think the context here is very important, though. Again, where and when Lincoln grew up, there was no way to get your goods to market unless you were close to a river. Then you might manage to float them down the Mississippi in a raft, that, a handmade raft that you might make, and you could get them all the way down to New Orleans, and then they could actually go quite a distance, because now you can put them on a ship and go all the way around the East Coast. But how are you going to get back home? How are you going to get back upriver? Well, before there were steamboats, people literally walked home. There's a story that Lincoln's dad actually made this trip and walked home twice. This is not a functioning market. This is not a formula for a thriving market. And what, the reason the canals, and especially the railroads, are so important, as soon as a railroad touches one of those hinterland areas, everything changes. Because now, what had been this, this uh, great obstacle cutting the country east from west, the Appalachian Mountains, now they're surmountable. Now you can buy manufactured goods from the east. Now you can buy clothing from the east. How are you going to buy them? You need cash. How are you going to get cash? You are going to grow for the market. So instantly, people who previously were subsistence farmers just growing for themselves, now they might not even grow their own food because they want to grow what's most efficient. So boom, instantly all these people are market players. And instantly you have a more diverse and um, uh, vibrant economy and there are different ways for people to rise in the world. And that, that was the key to Lincoln's and the Whig vision. There's also a cultural element to the vision, which is that people had to live orderly lives and had to discipline themselves in order to make it in the world and to make the most of their opportunities. And this is an ethic that Lincoln just evangelized for his entire life. When he became a lawyer, um, aspiring lawyers would write to him and say, well, how do I become a lawyer? And he would write back literally, work, work, work is the main thing. His stepbrother stayed back and living that kind of subsistence um, agricultural uh, life, life and would write to Lincoln when Lincoln made it in Springfield asking him for loans. And these letters that Lincoln would write back, I'm sure they were well-intentioned, but they were excoriating. They, they you know, would say, um, um, the reason why you're so destitute is because you idle away your time. Go to work. That is the only cure for your case. Now, this might have made for awkward Thanksgiving dinners, but it just showed you where, where Lincoln um, was coming from. And he didn't just evangelize for this. He lived it. He was obviously, uh, as was mentioned earlier, a determined reader. And we, now we celebrate reading. Um, reading as part of the Lincoln legend. But not everyone who was around Lincoln when he was growing up was so high on reading. You, you can read these quotes from eye, eyewitnesses and people who uh, were neighbors or friends, and they would say things like, oh, you know, he was lazy. He just spent so much time reading and thinking. Um, people would say, you know, he, he didn't have any taste for real work. He, he was reading when he could have been out killing snakes, literally killing snakes. Um, but Lincoln, and Lincoln's father kind of had this attitude of reading too. But Lincoln stuck with it. And he also, at a time when the country was soaked in alcohol, 
uh, was soaked in tobacco. I know it sounds kind of fun. Uh, and when, when coarse language was the norm, Lincoln didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't chew, he didn't swear. And he loved telling a story on himself about once sharing a railway car with a gentleman from Kentucky. And the gentleman from Kentucky offers him a shot of whiskey, no thanks. Offers him a fine cigar, no thanks. Offers him a chew of tobacco, no thanks. And finally, the Kentucky gentleman says, you know, sir, I want to tell you something I've learned in life. And Lincoln says, okay, you know, what is it? Those who have damn few vices have damn few virtues. Um, but Lincoln stuck with this, this orderly way of life anyway. And what happened through this ethic of self-improvement? Well, he makes himself a lawyer. And we tend now to have a view of lawyers as you know, maybe parasitic bottom feeders. Uh, I don't know whether that captures it. Present company accepted, if we have any attorneys in the audience. Uh, but then lawyers were really the shock troops of capitalism. They were helping create these new rules of the road for this emerging capitalist order. And initially, Lincoln was not much of a lawyer. There's a story that apparently when um, congressmen back then used to distribute seeds to their constituents, I guess kind of the pork barrel projects at the time. And apparently some of these seeds fell out of uh, Lincoln's pocket in his uh, law office. And the law office was so in such a shambles and um, so dirty, there was actually enough soil in the floor for a plant to grow up you know, in, in the corner somewhere. But eventually he made himself quite a lawyer. He was uh, a corporate lawyer and in fact was on retainer um, with the biggest corporation in the state of Illinois, which was the Illinois Central Railroad. And Lincoln's economics, uh, the philosophy, it had all the, everything to do with property rights and patent law. He called patent law one of the three greatest inventions of all human history. Um, Lincoln and the Whigs had a view that in a properly functioning market, there was no such thing as zero-sum economics. A rising tide lifted all boats. And for this reason, Lincoln just rejected the class warfare of the time and rejected the redistributionist economics of the time. Uh, a delegation of working men visited him in the White House during the war, and Lincoln famously said, let not him who is houseless tear down the house of another. Let him labor diligently and build one of his own. And fundamentally underneath all this was an appreciation of the dignity of labor and the right to keep the proceeds of what you earned. And Lincoln constantly came back to a line from Genesis, through the you shall eat through the sweat of thy brow or as he put it in more informal terms, he who earns the corn should eat the corn. And anything counter to that principle, basically, was an act of theft. And just to give you an idea how deeply felt this principle was for Lincoln, his father, when he was younger, would hire him out, as was his right. And Lincoln would go and hoe and plow and chop and all the rest of it, and his dad would take all the proceeds, as he could until Lincoln reached the age 21. Well, Lincoln said, and something that was self-pitying and was an exaggeration, but is very telling. He later said, I used to be a slave because he worked and someone else took the proceeds of his labor. And this obviously goes to his view of real slavery. Slavery was theft. It was theft of other people's labor. As he called it in the second inaugural, famously, it was unrequited toil. And he maintained that this principle was so basic it was such a matter of nature and natural rights. In this little fragment he wrote for himself, he said, even the ant, you know, the lowest creeping, crawling insect, if that ant finds a crumb and that ant works to drag that crumb back to the nest, that ant knows through its labor the crumb belongs to it. Try to take the crumb from the ant and the ant will fight you because it knows uh, it belongs um, to it. So, um, he believed that no one could misunderstand this principle unless they were doing it willfully, which he thought was what was happening in the South. Now, the South countered this kind of criticism. The South said, okay, we have slaves and human bondage, um, but you have wage slaves in the North. You have these people who make very little money and they have to work in factories and you pretend you care about them, you pretend they're free, but they're just, they're just they're like our slaves except for they're not cared for as well and your man-eat-man -man, uh, individualist, uh, individualistic society in the North. And Lincoln just rejected um, this with all his being because he said that the genius of our system of free economy is that he who labors for another last year labors for himself this year, and next year 
he hires someone to labor for him. And I think that's such a wonderful, succinct explanation of how this country uh, should work. And Lincoln's rhetoric throughout this time was suffused with a profound sense of loss. It's because he believed rightly that the founders tolerated slavery, but they were embarrassed by it. They didn't get rid of it because there was no easy way to get rid of it. Um, because you wouldn't have a constitution without it. So the constitution tolerates it, but it doesn't mention it because it didn't want to give it that sort of recognition. And in the 1850s in the South, you had growing up something that was different, a positive, an affirmative defense of slavery, where people are saying, this is an institution from God. This is an institution that's good for the slaves, and that's good for everyone else uh, in the society. And for Lincoln, he believed we had to go back. We had to go back to the founders. So his project was renewal through restoration. And in American culture, pretty much always, we celebrate the things that are new. Lincoln unabashedly talked about those old time men, those founders, the old iron men with their old declaration of independence and their old faith, and he, and he pointed the country back to it. As he said, our Republican soil, our Republican robe, sorry, is soiled and dragged through the dust. Let us repurify it and wash it white in the spirit, if not the blood, of the revolution. And I maintain that for American conservatives, that always should be our project. Creating a better society, creating an opportunity society, but doing it through returning to our principles and to the founding. So here you have this American, great American figure. He loves a dynamic economy. He believes profoundly in individual striving and initiative and responsibility. He rejects cl class warfare. He reveres the founders, yet we're supposed to believe that Barack Obama is his legitimate heir. I, I'll have none of it. He is one of ours. And I think it's... Um, And I think it's, it's so important for us to hearken back um, to Lincoln because we have a crisis of opportunity in this country. Um, the left complains about inequality. We hear a lot about inequality. Inequality is inevitable in a free society. And the same kind of trends towards inequality we've seen in this country, we've seen uh, in other advanced economies around the world. What we should be judging ourselves by, I believe, is mobility. How fluid and open a society are, are we? How easy is it for people who start at the bottom to make their way up? And the tragedy is we are not nearly as good at that as we think we are. We imagine that we're the most fluid and open society on earth, but we're not. When you look at uh, measures of mobility, Western European countries, some of them outpace us. Other English-speaking countries outpace us. Scandinavian countries outpace us. And this is partly a matter of broad economic trends, but it's, it's also very important in a way that, and I think this is something that's neglected, it also has to do with the social breakdown in this country. It has to do with the erosion of marriage, has to do with the erosion of the work ethic, and the erosion of personal responsibility. And I think it behooves conservatives and the Republican Party to address this crisis of opportunity with what is really, I would say, a tripart Lincolnian program. What do we do uh, to increase the dynamism of our economy, which requires changing a lot of programs and structures that were handed down to us uh, from in the 1930s or the mid-1960s? What do we do to increase education uh, in this, enhance education in this country. We have an education system that not just K through 12, but in college is broken and wasteful. And what do we do to forge a return to what I would call just basic bourgeois virtues? And this isn't a matter of Bible thumping. It isn't a matter of moralizing. It's just a matter of getting across, if you want to make it in this country, the basis of aspiration, the first couple of steps up on the ladder are family, work, self-discipline, and self-improvement. And <laughs> and was mentioned earlier, I see a lot of Lincoln 
and Reagan, because there's the similarity with the difficult relationship with the father. Lincoln's uh, more difficult than Lincoln's. At least, you know, Lincoln's um, dad was a, was a good man, uh, but a limited man and, and not a, a drinker. The rise from obscurity, where Lincoln's circumstances were more difficult uh, than Reagan, but, uh, Reagan's, but Reagan certainly wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. The, the kind of emotional distance both men had. You know, they had a wonderful common touch, but at the same time, very few intimate friends. You know, Lincoln, um, even the people who were closest with him in the White House just said there was this line beyond which you couldn't pass with him. The use of humor, and with both of them, humor was a tool. Humor was something they used to make a point, or to put someone off, or to um, uh, just delay and play for time, or just to amuse themselves. But a the very important political tool. And then the, the, the deep humanity of both men. And then just most importantly, uh, the deeper purposes. Because Lincoln helped create a commercial economy. Reagan revitalized a commercial economy. Different means from both of them, given the different context of their time, but the same end. Reagan, a great emancipator on a global rather than a national scale. And then finally, both revering the founders, both making those principles the basis of their programs. So I'll just leave you with one last thought, and I'm going to go back to an, another Lincoln quote. Before anyone had heard of him in the 1830s or 1840s, he gave what's known as the Lyceum Address. And he talked about how even the United States then, which was a very weak and immature country, even then, it was invulnerable to military assault. You can, he said you can take all the armies in the world, put the best general in the world at their head, give him Napoleon, and that army couldn't step on the Blue Ridge Mountains or take a dip in the Ohio River by force of arms. But then he went on to say, if destruction be our lot, we ourselves must be our author and its finisher. And that's still true today. And he went on to say, uh, as a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. So, ladies and gentlemen, my recommendation would be that we resolve to live. Thank you very much. Mr. Lowry has uh, agreed to take questions. We have a number of our staff who have microphones who are kind of scattered throughout the audience. So if you have a question you'd like to ask, uh, please raise your hand and one of our staff members will find you. Looks like we have a question right here. Mr. Lowry, what, which school of thought do you uh, espouse with regard to the future of the Republican Party? The Mark Levin, Rush Limbaugh school of thought that we must nominate a conservative no matter what, or the Marco Rubio, uh, even Mitt Romney, Jeb Bush school of thought that we must win no matter what. I'm not going to choose between those two. I, I really think I, I have not given up on the idea you can have both. <laughs> um, you know, and, and the conventional wisdom is, oh, Re Republicans are losing because they're nominating uh, these unelectable right-wing maniacs. No, we've been nominating unelectable, you know, reasonable people, right, with John McCain and, and Mitt Romney. And I, I just think this is how I, I square the circle. I, I want a conservative nominee. I want a conservative president. And I, I think it's but I also want to elect someone, but it's the wrong way to go about it usually just to try to pick who's most electable. What we need to do um, is find someone like Reagan, we're never going to find someone with those kind of skills probably, but someone who connects with the real problems people are feeling in their daily lives with a conservative program. And one of the things that it drives me a little nuts. I haven't been to this beautiful place before. I've mostly seen it on TV when there are people standing on stage in debates talking about Ronald Reagan who will never be a, a Ronald Reagan ever and don't really understand why people voted for Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan didn't run saying, I'm an ideological conservative. I'm a Reaganite. Vote for me. You know, he, people voted for him because there are dire problems in the country, 
right? You had inflation, double-digit inflation, double-digit interest rates, you had gas lines, you had humiliation abroad, and he, you had bracket creep in income taxes, it was biting um, middle class, taking more middle class people's earnings every single year, and he had a solution for every single one of those things and more. And I just take my uh, parents as an example. They voted for Reagan. They weren't really conservative. Um, they became more conservative over time, but the price of chicken was too high in the grocery store, right? And this is where I think the Republican Party has become disconnected with those everyday kind of concerns. I hate the debt, I hate the debt as, almost as much as anyone, but the debt is not what people are thinking about every single day. They're thinking about how do they get health insurance and the cost of health care and the cost of college. So I would just urge Republicans, every time they say the D word, you know, to, to talk about health care too, to talk about their agenda to um, change college and make it more affordable. So I, I think we need a conservative as always, but we need a conservative who connects on this stuff and just doesn't think he's going to be elected by asserting his conservatism over and over again. That will get you 35 percent, or actually in a real election, it'll get you 47 percent, which equals nothing. Absolutely nothing. We got 47% last time. We need to get 51%. And if you actually connect with people at this level, um, that's the way to do it. Uh, Mr. Lowry, I'm a public school teacher, and uh, one of the ways that uh, I get this whole kind of concept across is uh, through Mary Lincoln. And uh, can you just answer two questions about her, possibly, or give yeah, me some I'll try. thumbs up? Um, why do you think she was so maligned? Mm -hmm. um, and the second question is, do you think it's possible that she had uh, post-traumatic stress disorder? Yeah. So I mean, she um, certainly did have enough trauma. No, absolutely. I don't delve a lot into this, because this is one of these things, there's so many things about Lincoln where it's a huge controversy, and there's just enormous literature on it, and if you delve into it, you'll never escape. So I, I just tried to, to focus on what I think was most important about him and to the argument in my book. I am not, I, I'm soft on Mary Todd. Um, one, she was a little bit crazy, um, but she, the personal tragedies she encountered were just harrowing. And Lincoln was not the easiest man to be married to, um, I believe. You know, it, there's a, a scene in um, the movie. Did you see the movie, Lincoln? Um, there's a scene where he's sitting alone. And for me, this is the most telling scene in the movie, oddly enough. He's sitting alone uh, at his desk. And there's a little um, clock, a watch, hanging off the desk. And he has a ruler or something. He's sitting there and just knocks... It's just knocking the clock back and forth, just watching it knock and knock and knock. And, and that, that was such an insight into him because he was a brooding personality. He's also fascinated with mechanics and logic. But that is not an easy person to be married to. And she said later, Mary Todd, that when he felt deeply, most deeply, he expressed the least. And I'm a little bit like that, not to the extreme, a little bit like that. And it drives my wife crazy, okay? So she did not have the easiest time. And also, it's important to remember, she was a, a huge catch for him. Now, there's a, a legend, I don't quite believe it, you don't know, but um, that when he was going to get married to her, it was kind of a snap affair, that uh, he, some boy asked him, where are you going? He said, I'm going to hell, which is not the most <laughs> auspicious beginning to a, a marriage. But, you know, she, she went to a French academy, she had a pony as a pet that she showed off at Henry Clay's house, you know, this great statesman. And she was politically ambitious too. And that's really important. And, and people tend to look down on that when it's a woman, that's a bad thing, right? You know, but it was really important if you're a politically ambitious um, man to have someone like that right with you, pushing you along. And during his first run for the Senate, which tends to get neglected, and run is a little bit of a misnomer because the state legislature decided, um, but when he was first trying to ascend to the Senate and the legislature was voting, she was right there in the gallery ticking off every single name, and she cared just as much as he did. So that, that was very important. So I wouldn't say I'm a fan of Mary Todd, but I do think maligned is the right word. Um, what do you think that Lincoln would think of us doing so much trade with China, a country that does not apparently have any of our basic values and enslaves 
basically enslaves its own people to produce the commercial manufacturing and of course Tiananmen Square, et cetera. Yeah, what would Lincoln think of trade with China? It's an excellent question. Um, he'd be, I have a little trouble with, with this one because I'm such an instinctive and reflexive free trader, but he obviously w was not. Um, and um, I think would be probably, this is one of the things that's just hard 150 years later, but would be dismayed at a country cheating the way China does and then the, sort of contributing to the undermining of our manufacturing base because of that. So this is something where he would be, be in a, a, a different place probably than, than I am. And probably, I just take from the tenor of the question, probably be where you are on this issue. Why do you compare the family structure of the United States to Scandinavia when their family structure is broken as well? Say Denmark has a 50% uh, illegitimate birth rate. Yeah, that's, that's a, good, a good question. Um, one, I wasn't comparing the, the out of wedlock um, child rearing. I was comparing the, the mobility rates and Scandi Scandinavia does better than us. My understanding, I'm not a scholar in this issue, is those relationships in Scandinavia, although the people aren't married, they basically act like they're married and they're much more stable than um, such relationships here in the United States. And it's just, the fact is the social science says all things being equal and all things are never quite equal and you don't want to sound like you're condemning any individual person because life is complicated and everyone has uh, struggles, but all things being equal, it's just better if the mom and dad are there for the kids. And what, what really dismays me about this is if you take, divide the country into thirds by education, the top third has a college degree. They are living kind of a version of leave it to beaver kind of lifestyles. The illegitimacy rate among those people is 6%. And I don't know, that's probably, I don't know, 1950s level or maybe earlier. Then you look at the middle. And when Ronald Reagan was president, and this is just one of the ways the country is so different, in 1982, among that middle swath, graduated from high school, some college, but not a high school degree, it was 14%. It was very close to where you know, the upper end uh, is now. Now it's 44%. You know, it's almost half. And you have on all these kind of measures of what we consider sort of basic values, you, you have the middle kind of sliding back to where the, the lower end is. And because this stuff is so important to the economics of a family, it just makes it really hard for people to get ahead in, a, in an environment where you have a lot of headwinds because of the, the global uh, economy. So we somehow have to get across, and it's not easy, that it's important to have, um, be married before you have kids because it's going to make your life easier and it's going to make your kid life uh, easier. And I think it's one of these things that conservatives, we can say it, um, it would help if Republican candidates were a little more forthright about it because they don't want to talk about it either. But ultimately, I think Democrats have to say it. You know, if Barack Obama gave that Morehouse speech, which I thought was quite good, and whether you're familiar with it, um, on the importance of fatherhood and family, if he gave that speech, you know, every month and some found some way to do it, that would really be an important contribution to the cultural discussion um, in this country. But I think it's just very hard because the the liberal base does not like any of that stuff, thinks, it's, you know, thinks you're judging people and waging a war on women and all, all the rest of it. So this, this is the area where I'm probably most despairing about our national life. How do you think Lincoln would have felt about the way President Obama pushed the Obamacare through the Congress, the federal and the House and the Senate, and now there are many organizations trying to overthrow it and so it doesn't become permanent. Yeah. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, good question. I have to, I hate to say, but when it comes to legislative niceties, Lincoln was not a real stickler. Um, you know, and again, the movie Lincoln, everyone interpreted it as, oh, this is a sign of how everyone needs Washington needs to get together and compromise. Lincoln wasn't compromising when he was getting the 13th Amendment through. He was, he was acting as a matter of principle, and he would uh, tolerate all sorts of shenanigans and all sorts of compromises towards the, the, this fixed goal that he considered very important, again, as a matter of principle. So I don't think the, the manner of passage particularly would outrage him. I do think, and again, it's a guess, that um, um, 
because government in his day was just so much different. If all we did is what we did then and, and you know, funded some canals, we'd have almost no federal government. This whole welfare state grew up since then, and the whole welfare state, even though President Obama always talks about it in terms of in investment and in infrastructure, what it mainly does, by and large, is take money from some people and give it to others. And then you have this massive bureaucracy on top of it that didn't exist in the mid-19th century. And then have, you have all this development impeding regulation on top of that, which didn't exist, and I'm confident would appall uh, Lincoln. I, I, so the, the government dependency element, I think he would object to. I have to be very speculative about that. The lawlessness of the actual law, such as it is, I believe would bother him, because Lincoln worshiped the law. He, he um, gave wonderful speeches about this. And just the most recent example, the law says that if a state doesn't set up an exchange, you can't give subsidies to the people that are in the exchange. So what happens? The states don't set up the exchange, and they're going to pay out the subsidies anyway. And this just gets to a lawlessness that I believe uh, runs throughout uh, the Obama administration because they believe they are righteous and they believe um, their end justifies any um, breaking or um, shaping of the law towards that, that ultimate end. Hi, Mr. Lowry. Uh, I'd like to know what your thoughts are on the rest of the uh I guess that you say the major media market and, and why they seem to be afraid to ask Obama or his administration the hard questions. Uh, mm, because they're in bed with him? Do <laughs> you see yeah. any of that changing, though, in the future? No. <laughs> um, I'm being a little flip. I, you know, I do say, like, uh, if you go from ABC News, a job, take, move from a job at ABC News to a, bo a job at the Obama White House, you really shouldn't have to change health plans. You know, it's all, it's all the same organization. They're all basically the same kind of people. And I say this knowing a lot of them and, you know, liking a lot of them, but they're the same people. They socialize together. They, they intermarry across the government and, uh, and media. And it's just astonishing to me that after all we've done, organizations like the Media Research Center calling attention to to bias, calling it out, mocking it, and all the alternative institutions we've developed. You know, Reagan's time, it was National Review and Human Events. Now we have all these wonderful uh, conservative outlets. The liberal media is worse than ever. And just a big part of it is, you know, they fell in love in 2007 uh, with Barack Obama, and they knew the only way they could consummate this relationship was if he made it to the White House. And I found myself in a very odd position. You know, I used to joke that uh, the people I hung out with in New York, we had our run Hillary, run bumper stickers on the fronts of our cars. But I, was, I felt sorry for her during that primary because she could not get a break anywhere outside of Fox News. The mainstream media hated her because she stood in his way. And that's pretty much the way it's been for the last five years, except for now. And you know, this is a parentheses and just a phase, but um, I think when Gregory Hicks testified, he was such a compelling and serious figure, the media had to take him seriously. Then the media, at least initially, was, I think, genuinely outraged and surprised by the IRS thing. And then you had the AP subpoena, which was just like a punch to the solar plexus, because that's what they really care about themselves. You know? And I loved how they spent um, a couple months prior to that showering contempt on the NRA because the NRA was such a stickler over the Second Amendment. And the NRA had all these paranoid fantasies about creating a gun registry and how could you trust the government if it did that. Then you get one subpoena, the AP, and the media is exactly like that about the First Amendment. And the fact is we have 10 of those things in the Bill of Rights, not just one, and the First Amendment isn't just for them. Um, but that, that's created this period that where it's been a real um, downturn in Obama's uh, media coverage, but it'll, it'll come back. Uh, yes. Um, during the course of the Civil War, Lincoln was um, willing to suspend civil liberties at times, such as the right to rid of habeas corpus, expelling a copperhead politician into Canada, and sometimes suspending right to freedom of speech or permitting military authorities to yeah. do that. Uh, where would he stand on some of these uh, related controversies in relation to the War on Terror? I think he'd, you know, he'd be sympathetic to any commander-in-chief at a time of, of war. And as you allude to, he uh, interpreted his powers to the, the maximum. 
And he was faced with a, a crisis the likes of which we've never experienced, of course. And I think perhaps the habeas corpus suspension is analogous somewhat to the, the NSA program, because when Lincoln suspended it the first time, right, it was a very understandable circumstances. Right at the beginning of the war, Washington is undefended, there are no troops there, and troops coming from the north are blocked by pro-Confederate mobs in Baltimore. So he suspends along the line from Philadelphia to Washington to get the troops there. And this is not unconstitutional because suspending the writ of habeas corpus at a time of insurrection is right there in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 9, but it's arguably a congressional power, not a presidential power, but Congress wasn't in session, so what are you gonna do? And you know, Lincoln says, am I gonna let all the laws go by the wayside um, just because of, of um, this one. So that was understandable, but then the suspensions become routine. They become um, much wider. They cover the entire North, and uh, I think it's exaggerated the harm that was done by this because research shows most of the people who are caught up in military trials, they were draft dodgers, they were block cade runners, there are people who had been tried one way or the other. But the Supreme Court does say after the war, no, you can't suspend civilian trials when the courts are still open. So he went too far in the North. And I think the NSA program is, the closer you are to 9-11, the more understandable it is. And I'm basically sympathetic to it, but I think if you can have such a massive program with so many implications running on as a matter of routine for years and years and years, then you need to have more of an open debate about it than we had prior uh, to this point. So I, I do believe the commander in chief has vast war powers, but unless you know the Confederates or the enemy is knocking at the door in Washington, you do have the time to debate it and air it out uh, publicly. So I don't, I didn't like the the leak. I don't like Edward Snowden, the leaker, but I do think. Um, this is a debate we should have. And ideally, some senator or someone who knew a little bit about this program should have forced it. You know, should have gone to the floor every day saying, I know about this thing. I can't ex uh, explain it in detail because it's classified, but it alarms me. It'll probably alarm you if you learn about it. Mr. President, I urge you to give a speech and discuss this in a rational way, uh, in a reasonable way, responsible way, so we can have a national debate about it. And now at least we will have that debate. One more question. Uh, so we're going to go here. He will be signing books afterwards. I'm sure you can, if you didn't get a chance, I'm sure he'll be happy to. One facet that I haven't heard mentioned that really concerns me as a person who's in between youth and maturity uh, and have a family and am an educator is youth. And I read recently that Winston Churchill said, if you don't have compassion when you're young, you don't have a heart. And if you're not conservative when you're old, you don't have a brain. <laughs> so my question is about youth viewing maturity right now. And I'm looking at 2008 and the post-derivative financing debacle that has unleashed a feeding frenzy against all the institutions that I see, marriage, whether, you know, whether, whatever people's opinions are. It's just one of the many institutions among which you referenced a couple others, obviously uh, self-sufficiency and individual responsibility and self-discipline and all the attributes that we, we look at, Abraham Lincoln, Ronald Reagan, and so on, in character. Um, so my question is, in a reactive political environment where we have the left stretching from the right and voters again in 2016 looking at the decision that they'll have, the exploitation, marketing, Twitter, Facebook, and all the games, how do we engage the audience in an in a Abraham Lincoln spirit, in a polarized environment that's far, far more complicated than it was in his time in terms of the matrix of China and, and the EU and the dollar and all the other factors that you can throw into the pot for whoever takes over in 2016? Great question. You Thank know, you. first of all, the other Lincoln, uh, sorry, the other Churchill story I love that I think is very apt for what uh, we've experienced in, in Washington in the last several years, he, um, the story goes he was in the, uh, the bathroom off the, the floor of Parliament 
and the, the labor leader, Clement Attlee, shows up, and Churchill kind of scoots off as far as he can get away from him down, further down the urinal, and Clement Attlee is kind of needling him and said, saying, oh, you're feeling awfully modest today, aren't you, Winston? And Churchill said, no, Clement, I just know whenever you see something large and well-functioning, you want to nationalize it. Uh, <laughs> But you, you raised just an excellent point. And you know, my, my personal experience is somewhat troubling here because I didn't read Hayek and uh, Russell Kirk uh, as a child and then see Ronald Reagan and say, oh, this is a conservative, this is the guy I like. No, I saw Ronald Reagan and I realized I liked him. You know, there was, there was something exciting, new, different, and cool about him. And, that changed me for the rest of my life because then I went and I read up and I saw this stuff made sense and I believed it. Um, and I think you know you, you could have the same thing happening with a lot of kids now with Obama, except for it's happening uh, on the left side of the spectrum. I think it's a tough nut to crack. A couple things you just have to be out there making the case. You have to be on Twitter. You have to be on Facebook. You have to be doing all these things and hope eventually the reality comes through because the bill is being left at their doorstep. And it's not as though they're getting some great deal now that's gonna have some terrible consequence in the future. They're getting a horrible deal now as well. <laughs> you know, it's hard for them to find jobs. They're more debt than ever from college. College is more expensive than ever. ever. So we just have to constantly come back and make our case that our program is better. And this is a, one last thought. This is a aspect of Reagan and also Lincoln. You know, Lincoln said in one of his speeches, a, a drop of honey catches more flies than a gallon of gall. And I think some of our leaders and some of our friends, they n need to realize to be persuasive, sometimes a little bit of a soft touch, being a little friendly, a little likable, helps. And you know, we have a political environment where inflammatory comments get a lot of attention and there sort of uh, creates an incentive for inflammatory comments. And we all enjoy them, I'm sure. I personally enjoy them, but we're not the only ones listening when these things are said. So if you're gonna go out um, and uh, find new people, you have to be persuasive and winsome, right, in the way Reagan was. Because what were Reagan Democrats before they were Reagan Democrats? They were Democrats, right? He crossed the line and he broke through. And that's just what we have to seek to do over and over again. And eventually we'll find someone who can actually do it. Maybe not the way Reagan did, but at least a, a little bit. And that's gonna make a huge difference. Thank you very much. Thank you.